Hello everyone, welcome back to Fraud on the Telly. Today we are extending our Critical Role Breakdown and Lore series by explaining everything we know about the Arms of the Betrayers, the unholy weapons of the Betrayer Gods in Critical Role, including their lore and some of their in-game mechanics. As always, if you enjoy the video and learn something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out our Who Are the Betrayer Gods and Prime Deities videos. Obviously, this video is going to contain spoilers for some of the Critical Role campaigns, namely EXU Calamity, but potentially some of the other ones, so just consider yourself warned. Like our other lore videos, before we explain these powerful weapons, we need to do a little Exandria history lesson. Long ago, the gods came to the world of Exandria. At the time, it was a place of elemental chaos devoid of much life, as it was ruled by the Primordials. The Primordials allowed the gods to stay, and over time, they began creating life. These Primordials would grow disenfranchised with the gods, as they felt it was wrong to give mortals access to divine magic. A group of the gods agreed with the Primordials, and sided with them. They would later be known as the Betrayer Gods. Together, the Primordials and the Betrayer Gods sought to destroy all mortals and reset life. They would eventually be defeated by the remaining gods, the Prime Deities. This war between Primordials and gods was known as the Schism. After the Schism, the Betrayer Gods would be locked away in a planar prism, until much time later, they were freed by an ambitious foolhardy mage named Vespin Koras. Once released, the Betrayer Gods would gather once more, attempting to destroy the mortals their god can love so much. This battle between Betrayer Gods and Prime Deities and mortals would be known as the Calamity. The arms of the Betrayer God would be weapons created by each of the eight Betrayer Gods using the life force of a greater fiend and then given to their evil champions. It's important to note that the arms of the Betrayer are noticeably different from the Vestiges of Divergence, specifically in that they bear souls of greater fiends, making them sentient weapons. The Betrayer Gods themselves did create Vestiges of the Divergence as well, but it's important to note that they're not considered arms of the Betrayer Gods. The arms of the Betrayer, like the Vestiges of Divergence, go through a various number of states like Dormant, Awakened, and Exalted, each bringing the weapon or armament more power. Number 1. The Blade of Broken Mirrors Created by the god Tharaz Dun, the Chained Oblivion, using the soul of a Glabrazu named Regazu, the blade is simple in its construct, a small dagger of jagged stone bearing a maze-like pattern. The soul of the Glabrazu pushes the wielder of the blade towards reckless action. In its dormant state, the wielder gains one minor beneficial property and one detrimental property. In addition, they now know Abyssal, gain a plus one to attacks and damage from the weapon. The weapon itself, if used as a ranged attack, will immediately return to the wielder. And as an action, get a load of this, the wielder can take any form of any humanoid creature killed by this blade. Yeah, this blade is kinda crazy and we haven't even seen its final form yet. In its awakened state, the second state, the user gains an additional minor benefit and detriment. The bonus to attack and damage increases to plus two, and the wielder may once a day cast for free one of the spells Fabricate, Hallucinatory Terrain, Major Image, and Phantasmal Killer with a DC 15. Even though you only get to use one of these spells per day, the utility of the choices given on a potentially melee-only wielder is pretty nuts. Finally, in its exalted state, the user gains one major beneficial property. The bonus now increases to plus three, the DC for the spells becomes 15, and as an action, the user can now go invisible. You know, maybe making a deal with Thara's Doom and listening to a demon try to make you commit Restless actions might be a small price to pay for all that power. Number two, Grovel Thrash. Quite the app name for a Warhammer, Grovel Thrash was created by Torog from a singular piece of obsidian carved with the images of screaming faces and infused with the souls of an Ulrith named Syria. It is said that Syria praises its wielder for causing pain and claiming treasure. Like all of the other arms of the Betrayer, the weapon itself has 120 feet of dark vision and hearing range, allowing for a lot of potential shenanigans from a DM with all of these sentient weapons. In its dormant state, the wielder gains one random minor positive and negative property, the ability to speak abyssal and infernal, plus one damage to attacks and damage made with the weapon, as well as making a successful weapon attack, the user can choose to deal an extra 2d6 bludgeoning but they themselves must take 1d6 psychic. Finally, the hammer gives its user advantage on insight checks to determine a lie. In its awakened state, the bonus increases to plus two. They gain additional properties. Once per day, the wielder, when hit with an attack from a physical creature within 30 feet, can use their reaction to deal psychic damage equal to the damage they just took from their attacker. As well, the user gains a burrowing speed equal to their walking speed, which makes sense seeing as the weapon was made by the Crawling King. Finally, in its awakened state, the hammer, like the dagger, grants the user one major positive property, and the bonus increases to plus three. 
when the wielder's health drops below half their max, the Warhammer deals an additional 2d6 bludgeoning, which is absolutely crazy. Imagine a blood hunter wielding this Warhammer, it's gonna make for some crazy combos. The user may now burrow through solid rock at half speed, and once per day can cast one of the spells Earthquake, Meld into Stone, and Stone Shape on a DC 17 save. Mazing pissing off a Goliath Barbarian wielding this bad boy. Number 3, The Lash of the Shadows, a whip created by the betrayer god Sahir from the soul of a Marileth named Sizzleth. I'd hope I pronounced that right. The whip is made of snake skin, seeing as Zahir is the creator of snakes. The tails of the whip are that of animated snakes heads as well. Like the other arms of the betrayer, in its dormant state the user gains one positive and negative property. As well, they now know abyssal and draconic. The whip has plus one to attack rolls and damage done with it, and on a successful hit the wielder can now attempt to poison its victim on a DC 13 con save. In its dormant state the user may choose from two types of venom. One, the serpent's venom, which deals 3d6 poison damage to the target or half on a successful save, or the dead eyes poison, which blinds the target for one hour on a failed save. Dead eyes, however, can only be used once per day. Like the other weapons in their awakened state, the weapon's bonuses increases to plus two, the poison DC increases to 15, and they get access to a new poison ghoul's blood. On a failed save, ghoul's blood paralyzes the target for a minute. Target may make additional saving throws at the end of their turn though. Like Deadeyes, ghoul's blood can only be used once per day. Finally, in its exalted state, the user gains one positive property, the bonus increases to plus three, while the save increases to 17. As well, they get access to easily the best poison, Cockatrice Tears. On a failed save, the target turns into stone. They may repeat the save again on the end of their next turn. If they fail that save, the target is then petrified for 24 hours. I'm a big fan of this weapon as its power curve is a little different from some of the other arms of the betrayers. As getting access to 3d6 poison you can use on every successful hit in its dormant state seems incredibly good. Number 4, Ruin's Wake. A spear created by Grumsh, said to have been created from the bones of an ancient gold dragon and infused with the soul of a Balor named Yerowish. This Balor encourages its wielder to respond to all problems with violence, which just screams Grumsh. Because as you'll come to see, this is the ultimate I attack every turn weapon. In its dormant state, the wielder knows Abyssal and Orc and gains one positive and negative property. Spear is considered a plus one weapon, and on a successful attack, the weapon deals an extra D8 piercing damage. Like the dagger, if the spear is made as a ranged attack, it immediately returns to the wielder, which is freaking awesome, especially for someone who loves spears, because spears don't get enough love in D&D. As well as when the wielder is hit with a melee attack, they may use the reaction to make a melee attack in return. In its awakened state, the user gains more properties. The bonus increases to plus two, and the extra piercing damage is now 2d8. As well, once per day, the user may now speak a command word, transforming the spear into a bolt of lightning. The bolt can be thrown up to 120 feet in a line. Every creature within the line must succeed on a DC 15 deck save or take 8d6 lightning damage. I'm not sure if this attack also deals the weapon damage to its target. If this does, this shit's actually broken. Finally, in its exalted state, the user gains one major property. As well, the item now becomes a plus three weapon. In addition, the wielder may now once per day use the bonus action to release a battle cry, granting all chosen creatures within 30 feet of them advantage on attack rolls until the start of the wielder's turn. If you thought that was good, the spear itself, infused with Grumsh's rage, causes the wielder once per day, if reduced to zero hit points, to regain hit points equal to half the total dealt to them. All of the arms of the Betrayer are themed around the Betrayer gods who crafted them, but none seem to fit it more truly, in my opinion, than Ruins Wake and Grumsh. Well, except for maybe this next weapon. Number 5, the Mace of the Black Crowns. Asmodeus would create this mace upon returning to Exandria. He would use the soul of an Aranyes named Zartaza. The mace is large, bearing a heft made of black iron and a head from ruby. It is said Zartaza, the Aranyes whose soul is in the ruby, alters its wielder's dreams to push them towards collecting souls for Asmodeus. It is presumed that Xerxes Alores was the first wielder of this mace. In its dormant state, the mace grants the wielder access to Infernal as a language, as well as one minor positive and negative property. As a bonus action, the wielder can speak a command word to set the mace ablaze. While lit, it's lit, the mace gives 40 feet bright light and additional 40 foot dim light, as well as it deals an additional 1d6 fire damage. Once per day, the user can use an action, Summon Devil, to summon an imp who is friendly to the wielder and their companion. 
into Wake and State, the bonus is increases to plus two, with the fire damage increasing to 2d6 as well. In addition, the wielder gains a resistance to poison damage and can now summon a freaking bearded devil. Like the other weapons in its exalted state, the wielder gains one major positive property. The bonus also increases to plus three. The fire damage increases as well to 3d6. As well, the wielder is now resistant to both fire and poison damage, and the summon devil feature can now be used to summon a barb devil, which has a CR of five, by the way. Actually, a pretty insane ability at just the cost of one action, making it basically better than Planar Ally. Number six, Will of the Talon. A great war pick made by Tiamat from gold, decorated with gems, representing the five colors of chromatic dragons. The Talon is said to be made from the soul of a bone devil, Ashtirian, who orders the wielder to take charge of situations. In its dormant state, the wielder now understands Draconic and its Fernal, as well as gaining one minor negative and positive property. The pick being made from the Queen of Dragons bestows its wielder with abilities of a dragon. Once per long rest, the wielder may enact Frightful Presence as a bonus action, forcing creatures within 30 feet to make a DC 13 wisdom save or be frightened. As well, once per day, the user can call upon the breath of a dragon, unleashing one of the chromatic dragon breaths that they choose, dealing 3d6 of any of that chosen damage. In its awakened state, the weapon increases to a plus two. As well, the spirit of the dragon becomes stronger, increasing the DC for both the breath and the frightful presence to 15. As well, the breath weapon's damage increases to 46, and the user being blessed by Tiamat is now resistant to acid, cold, fire, lightning, and poison. Yeah, you heard me right. That's all the resistances. The spirit of the dragon further grows in the wielder in the exalted state as its bonuses increase to plus three. The DC for the saves is now 17, and the breath weapon deals a whopping 5d6. Still, the breath can only be used once per day, so it feels pretty balanced even though I think they could have given it two charges. I can only imagine though how insane this weapon would have been if the breath had more uses. Still, imagine how unkillable your barbarian could become wielding the will of the Talon. Number seven, Silken Spite. A rapier made from spider silk with an onyx pommel. The Silken Spite was constructed by Nolf, the Spider Queen, made from the soul of a Yaklel named Cinefex. In its dormant state, the blade grants the wielder the ability to speak Abyssal, Elvish, and Undercommon. As well, the user gains 60 foot dark vision or 120 foot dark vision if they already have dark vision. Dang yo, that's a lot of dark vision. As well, the wielder is granted a climbing speed equal to their walk speed, and they can use it to walk across vertical surfaces and ceilings without their hands. The blade is considered plus one and as an action can be coated with poison which lasts for one minute or until an attack is landed. The target must succeed on a DC 13 save or be poisoned for one hour. If they fail the save though by five or more, they fall unconscious immediately until they take damage or are roused. In its awakened state, the bonus increases to plus two, the poison DC becomes 15, and the wheeler once per day can cast one of the following spells, cloud kill, darkness, levitate, and web. Once entering its exalted state, the weapon now increases to plus three. The poison DC now becomes 17, the user can now see through magical darkness, and once a day as a bonus action when in dim or dark light, the wheeler can teleport to another spot in dim or dark light within 60 feet. Overall, it's a powerful weapon, but in my opinion, when you compare it to the other arms of the Betrayer in their respective states, it just feels like it's lacking some oomph. Number eight, the Bloody Inn. Our final unholy weapon, the Bloody Inn, is an Anamentine Morningstar crafted by the Betrayer God Bane from the soul of a pit fiend named Izelzi. The spikes in the Morningstar reach a foot long with a jagged blade on its pommel. Like all the other arms of the Betrayer, it grants the user properties. In addition, they learn Infernal. The Morningstar has a plus one bonus. Once per day, the wielder may cast one of the following spells, Charm Person, Dominate Person, or Fear on a DC 13 save. As well, they receive advantage on Intimidation checks. In its awakened state, the bonus to the weapon increases to plus two. When hit with a melee attack, the user can use their reaction to return 1d6 psychic damage to the attacker. Most interesting though, if the wielder reduces a creature to zero hit points with the Morningstar, they can force any creature they choose within 15 feet of them to make a DC 15 wisdom save. On a fail, the person is frightened of the wielder until the end of the wielder's next turn. In its exalted state, the bloody end's bonus increases to plus three, dominate person is added to the spell list, DC for the fear and spells becomes 17, and the retaliatory psychic damage increases to 2d6. And yeah, that's it for the Arms of the Betrayer, the unholy powerful weapons of the Critical Role universe. Which weapon was your favorite? Personally, I'm a big fan of the Will of the Talon and the Ruins Wake. I can only imagine the destruction that would come in my D&D games with literally any of these weapons. As always, if you enjoyed the video and learned something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out our Who Are the Betrayer Gods video, as well as our other EXU Calamity content. Let me know in the comments down below what arm of the betrayers would you like to see make an appearance in Critical Role. And as always, guys, stay safe out there. I will see you all in the next one. Peace, love. I'll do.